Kia ora. Uh, my name's Cowan Jones and I'm here with uh, Dame Claudia Orange, uh, tēnā koe te kahurangi. Tēnā koe. And we're in the National Library at the Hea Tohu exhibition and just, just right next door to the space where there are copies of Te Tiriti. And I'm going to be talking today with Dame Claudia about her contribution and her scholarship to the public understanding of Te Tiriti. So, Cohen, you've got some questions for me, I bet. What about firing them at me and let's go? Okay. So, the first question I have, Claudia, is how did you get started on working on Te Tiriti? Oh, right. That's a good question. A long time ago, it seems like, I was doing a master's degree and some of the surprises I had um, were finding, for example, uh, that there, there, was, there were situations in the Maori world that mostly the public didn't really know about. And some of them were absolutely shocking. Uh, like I came across references that, and photographs of the sort of conditions of um, housing that Maori were living in, and even those that were being built by the government, um, quite shocked me. They, that was really out of the blue. So it was a, a period of the first Labour government. And another thing that I discovered was that even before they became the government, uh, they thought um, that they, when, if they ever became the government, they would do something for Māori, like setting up a tribunal uh, to investigate claims going back to 1840. Well, did they? No, they didn't. It took 50 years before uh, an act went through to set up the tribunal. So, so that started me off. Um, and it seemed to me logical that uh, I should be asking more questions. Well, you know, so we always think the treaty has been quite special. Uh, it's made New Zealand different, um, has it? And so uh, when a, uh, an early researcher on the tribunal, um, Ruth Ross, who had looked at the treaty copies, in, in including the Tiriti uh, in Te Reo, um, and realised the difference in understanding between the two. Um, when she was very ill, she said, I can't continue this, Claudia. I would really like you to continue this for me on the treaty. Mm -hmm. So that set me off. Wow. And I, I'm interested that you saw those social issues affecting Māori as being framed by Te Tiriti, or that Te Tiriti had something to say mm. to those. Um, because what was the, the state of scholarship around Te Tiriti like when you started your work? Well, uh, Ruth Ross had done this preliminary work, which I think was absolutely crucial. But, you know, she was a Pākehā uh, working in, a, in an area that was quite difficult to work in. But in addition to that, um, the Ngāta family, of course, Aparananata's son, a lawyer, had been also uh, looking at the legal aspects, including the Petroleum Act and other areas that had, in various, uh, many senses, uh, ignored Māori rights to land and so on. So um, I was really looking at a range of things um, that were a ground to start, at least. Um, but there was really only one book that had come out in 1914 and been reprinted in the 1930s, and that was Buick's one on the Treaty of Waitangi. Mm -hmm. And he'd had a crack at trying to list the names of those who had signed the treaty. So again, I thought, hmm, I wonder if this is actually accurate or not. So, you know, you start asking these questions, and I was very, very lucky because... Um, I was doing history across the road from Māori Studies Department in Auckland and I started doing um, te reo um, up to master's level with um, Pat Hohepa and Rangi Walker. So it was a very good situation where you could actually ask questions of those people too. Um, mm. In Meri Meri Penfold from Ngāti Kuri, I think it is, yeah. I think my interest has, has been no, no problem of being sustained because things started to move. I mean, you know, even though we had the tribunal set up in 1975, it only had the powers to look at claims that, that occurred after 1975. And so um, we, we began to think it was just a dead duck. 
and I think a lot of other people did too. And also a national government had come in and took their time, dragged their feet about setting it up, um, setting the tribunal up. And uh, then Ed, Eddie Jury, Tahikure Jury, took over as chairman of the tribunal. And then gradually, of course, those early reports that came out uh, on the Motu, um, Motutui and Taranaki um, and the Kaituna claim, um, they started to deal with the principles of the treaty, which were part of the act, um, and defining them. But really to define even claims and issues in the period they were talking about, they really had to go back. I mean, if you talk about the reefs, the Taranaki reefs being um, uh, wrecked with the exudate from the local Singa gas plant and, and, uh, and other exudates, um, you have to look back at what, what happened in the Taranaki in the wars, in the, in the New Zealand wars. Mm. So um, my interest just kept on getting prompted by different things at the very time when I myself was starting to research. Um, I went to England to, on a, uh, I was lucky enough to get a student scholarship. Um, but I think the treaty, you know, you can, you can look at Q at all, uh, at Q, they have all the records um, of the New Zealand government going way back. But a person had already done that research, Peter Adams had also, well, had done an excellent PhD sitting at Oxford and drawing on the records. But I was quite keen to look at the treaty on the ground in New Zealand. And the only way you could do that would be to come back to New Zealand. And then in actual fact, almost everything you looked at, there were issues if you looked at them from a Maori point of view rather than from what was necessarily written and reported on by officials. So I kept on going because at that time, we're talking now the late seven, 1970s and early 80s, it was quite clear um, that things were going to keep on bubbling and the move by the Labour government coming in in 1984 to move the, um, the mandate of the tribunal to look at claims back to 1840 um, was uh, an absolute bonanza that in the sense that it unlocked the whole of New Zealand history to be looked at. Mm. But I was going to say, you know, even though you write <coughs> uh, from a point of view of where you're at with history, um, you, you know, history is being made all the time. Mm. And I think that became increasingly true as reports from the tribunal came out. Um, and also I ha ha felt I was extremely lucky that there were other historians who were working um, on related areas like Michael Belgrave at the tribunal um, and also people working towards a settlement like Richard Hill on the Treaty of Waitangi Policy Unit. Um, but it was obviously going to take time um, before um, they could set up a settlement. And there's this, through that whole period, there's the Waitangi Tribunal starting, as you've talked about, uh, the government looking to think about how to engage in the settlement of claims. And as you've mentioned, these current issues have this deep history, um, and it's only through really understanding that historical context that you're able to provide um, some redress or address some of the current contemporary issues. True, that's true. Yes. And so what, how was your, your early work received? So your first book published in 1987, I think. Um, how, how was that received at the time? Well, I, I actually, it was a PhD, um, and I had finished that in 1984. And, um, and so gradually uh, I took up a job in Wellington and kept commuting to Auckland, but started working on revising it for publication. And of course, publication, as you know, takes time. So it was about November 1987 before it came out. But by that stage, there had been pretty marked moves by government already under the Labour government. You know, I always remember I had started work at the Dictionary of New Zealand Biography, 
and uh, we had an office there uh, quite close to the Court of Appeal and the 1987 Court of Appeal case um, um, uh, that the New Zealand Maori Council had brought against the, in challenging um, the 1986 um, Act, um, uh, which looked as if it was going to end up privatising um, corporations and also for land that could have been available for settlements being taken out of any position where, uh, that the, where the Crown could influence what happened if a settlement came up about that land. Um, that was an exciting time um, with people popping in and out of our office and questioning and so on. And then Tippany O'Regan realising that I did have a PhD and, and asking to let it out before, the, before it was published. Yes, yes, <laughs> I, I know having read through the judgment in that yes. case, seeing reference to the, the proofs, I think, of, of your, your, yeah. your book before it was published. That's right. Yes. Uh, and you've mentioned a number of people already that have been, had been influential, but uh, uh, who, were, who were the others who might have been uh, inspiring your own work or laying a foundation for some of your own work too? I think um, those who, as you get older, you do look back. Um, mainly I've been so busy over the years, I've never had time to look back and think about that. But, you know, it was hugely influential having people like Rangi uh, Walker, who had been so articulate in the Auckland Māori Council for some years. He had written um, regularly for um, the listener and, and just highlighting some of the issues that nobody else had the capacity to write about or hadn't, hadn't been asked by the listener. Um, but also, part of Māori studies, uh, there was a gentleman called Peter Wairua, and he had decided to come to university late. <laughs> I don't know how old he was, about 70-ish, I think, from Whangarei. And um, he said to me once, um, you, and so he, he liked me to sit down and we would just talk. And um, I said, look, I'm struggling to find out more about that, those 19, 1870s when uh, Ngati uh, Kahu and Te Ngati Rahiri in, at Waitangi started to talk about the treaty. And there were the sons of those who'd signed had started to develop uh, Titi Marae um, as a place to talk. And so they had built the house that was called Treaty of Waitangi. And they had also built a marvellous stone monument um, that had the words of Te Tiriti um, on it. And um, he said, I can help you there. I've got some of the minutes of the meetings that were held. <laughs> so that was exciting, mm. um, just to be able to have a look at that. They were all in Tirao, but because I had enough competence in translating, I could quite quickly uh, read them and get the gist mm -hmm. of it. Mm. So that was an exciting period. Yes. I've always wondered what's happened to those, actually. Mm. Yeah. And, and so you've talked about some of the, the academic historians um, and as well as mentioning some of the people who were involved in yeah. claims and policy. Uh -huh. uh, and you know, one of the things when, when one looks at your, your contribution and scholarship is that you see very much a kind of public face to the work that you, you have been very concerned with public understanding of New Zealand history and Te Tiriti mm. in particular. And that's not just in relation to, to your, your books, but um, you mentioned the Dictionary of New Zealand Biography, um, your work with Te Papa and other, other museums, Museum at Waitangi for instance. So how would you reflect on that importance of public understanding? Well I think one of the difficulties as you're working on a topic like this I realised that people would shy away from me because they didn't want to talk about it. Um, there was a really a gap, a huge gap for several decades really, between the, the average understanding in the public and um, the strength with which Māori feeling had really started to rise, 1970s at Waitangi, um, and the protests there were quite 
clear of the, the strength of feeling that was there. Um, so from my point of view, it just seemed to me that you had to, you know, you had to bring to published form or in other media um, that ability for the public to start understanding the extent of Maori um, claims and needs. Um, and it was also the continuity of the Maori voice. People kept think, saying, well, you've got onto this because it's just come up in the 1980s. I said, look, you're very wrong. I mean, I started on this way back in the early 1970s, actually, and, and it, you know, it just has kept on going. Um, so it's that continuity um, of the Māori voice that I think has been very strong and very effective. I mean, and it started straight after 1840, actually. So, you know, you're, you're looking at a whole pattern of behaviour that makes sense if, if you write about it, study it, research it and write about it. And because of pe people like Peter Wairua, Rangi Walker and Pat Hohepa, um, their, their research uh, both in traditional European sense and also in the Mātauranga Māori sense um, had an enormous bearing um, on my uh, confidence that I should quietly move ahead. And it, we're not talking, of course, about looking at the treaty and an individual iwi, because that is really not the business of a Pākehā historian. Um, it seems to me that you're looking at the relationship between the state and Māori, um, and, or before governments and Māori. So or the state and Māori is a fast and easy way to put it, actually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think probably when I first met you was in the context of the Te Papa Treaty debate. Oh, yes. Um, oh. And so that was another avenue yes. for public conversations about yes. Te Tiriti. We, that's quite true, and thank you for reminding me. Um, this was the early 19, when was it? It was 2004. Um, it was quite clear then that yet another Labour government had started to make decisions. For example, the Foreshore and Seabed Act um, that came through was appalled people um, because they really just didn't understand the genesis of why it had come up through the Native Land Court or the Maori Land Court then. Um, so deciding to have, uh, say, treaty debates at Te Papa, which is a neutral place for uh, people feeling confident to be able to express themselves. Um, and so I really wanted to have another person who could be with me on this mm. with, with confidence. And I think I asked you, Cohen, didn't I? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was, we had big houses. I mean, it was full um, auditorium. And also the trick was to actually bring together people who, many people really, who had the expertise, both Māori and Pākehā, um, for the particular topics that had become key areas in the public debate and, and media. So that we ran through a lot of those over a period of time, doing just sort of sometimes a two, maybe even three nights on this, and then we brought it back down um, as, as the public interest came, rose and waned. So it was, it was an exciting time, mm -hmm. actually. It was yes. interesting. Yes, and as you say, a real opportunity to address those, those issues that were really at the forefront of people's minds in relation to Māori and Te Tiriti and government. Yeah. Uh, and certainly the, the opportunity to bring together different voices yes. um, in conversation, actually, yes. to, was, was, I think, a really helpful. And it was the range of voices that um, felt confident to agree to our coming, mm -hmm. to, to their coming and uh, talking. And, you know, we were careful, too, about having a, asking them to get it on paper first <laughs> so that they could think through what it was they wanted to say because it's quite a short period that they had uh, was challenging for them, you know, about 20 minutes per speaker and another, you know, two speakers usually, and then you and I sort of fielding questions. Mm. We also did enter, uh, have protest uh, 
Carmen. Yes, yes that's right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, well, and maybe that's a, a, a good point to raise the question of, of whether uh, there is still a kind of disconnection perhaps between uh, what you've talked about as, as a, a very kind of consistent Māori view about Te Tiriti and a lot of your work which, which has done um, a great job in, in explaining that to other New Zealanders uh, and, and getting New Zealanders to better understand our history, but is there still is there still a gap there? Is there still some disconnection? Do you think between the public and and uh, and their understanding? Yes, yes. Um, I think inevitably there will be. I um, mean, one of the uh, interesting uh, moves that the present government has made is uh, looking to have history in schools. Um, it's going to take a while because um, the draft that came out earlier this year um, clearly is going to be take a while to put um, the content together. And, you know, um, I think that, again, you're going to have a new generation coming through in time that's going to be more au fait with the history of our country. Mm -hmm. um, they can draw on Dictionary of New Zealand Biography, where, where we did 3,000 biographies of people who'd made the place interesting, um, including um, a lot of Māori, many Māori, um, and also mm, doing the Māori biographies also in Te Reo. Mm. So, you know, there is a huge um, scope of material there to use in the schools. It's just going to be a matter of time. But if you look at the present generation working in the public service and in other areas of government, um, they're, they, they're, well, let's just say, they, they run from, say, you know, mid-20s to um, mid-60s. Um, they haven't had that advantage in schools and schooling. A few will have done history, but there was no compulsory history in schools, as is the case in some other countries. Um, so, you know, if they felt bad and guilty about uh, the treaty as uh, some of the settlements started to go through. Um, you know, that, that's, that's something that they shouldn't necessarily feel bad about. I mean, the, ang the, the reason is they can just find out more. There's far more now. I mean, when I started, there was only just, I think, you know, a sh small amount of published uh, material. But now we're looking at several thousand articles and books on the subject and um, public historians of various kinds and academic ones including yourself um, have written about the treaty and and just the broader elements uh, and aspects that the public need to be more au fait with mm. yeah and what about the role of uh, museums and uh, uh, exhibitions yeah. like Hetohu here at the National Library what what role did they play in this well, I think one of the hard things for the public is that a public, everybody, each person, learns in a different way. Um, some people learn by exchanging with, as we're doing now, and just talking about things. Others are readers and need something like a book and articles. Others um, are much more uh, attracted to and excited by visuals. And certainly, um, Hei Tohu is a marvellous uh, exhibition to have got off the ground and the excitement of bringing the actual documents out of a very quiet place and seldom visited place of archives that were looking after them with great care, but bringing them into a more public place, again, with great security but allowing people to have that access so that both here at Hei Tohu and also at Waitangi um, with the new museum there that we opened, that was opened in um, 2016 and then um, Te Rao Aruha, the one in the Māori Battalion opened next door and also upgrading the, the exhibitions in the Treaty House itself. You know, that puts out into the public a huge amount of material. Mm -hmm. And it's important that not only um, you are presenting the facts, you're also allowing people space and time 
to just think through and um, to feel, to, to experience the different feelings that the public's actually going to have. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you know, you can't slight that or criticize it. That's just people. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a degree of tolerance and understanding. Even if you feel very angry inside at times, it's not going to help. You know, there are just sort of major points in, in time that where something has hit you hard. Um, like Wiramu Tamihana to Ohoroa coming to Wellington to try to appeal to government in the 1860s. What would he, was he going to do with the land being taken, the co confiscation? What was he going to do with his people? You know, and being sent, taken out to dinner and then sent home. You know, I remember putting my head down and, and having a cry. I thought, this is just awful, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's only one situation of many mm -hmm. um, that one could refer to, yeah. Mm -hmm. So exhibitions are really important. Mm -hmm. And one area of work where there's been, I, I think, probably quite a lot of work done since your, your first book was published uh, is around thinking about the people who signed Te Tiriti and other documents like He Whakaputanga. Um, and of course, through Dictionary of New Zealand Biography and other things, you've had some role in that too. Why, why is that important to, to start to understand the people involved? Well, I think there's great diversity in the people who signed the treaty. Um, you know, you, you, there, there were some in the north that, in, with Ngāpuhi, in the broadest sense, um, who had had considerable experience of trading with Sydney or Pat Port Jackson, um, dealing with um, a, a large number of foreign shifts, ships coming in. Um, and the same, I guess, was similarly true probably in the Kapiti area here in Wellington. Um, but um, I was trying to think back to your question. Um, I think that with, with, with the growth of Maori um, academics, I think the, the real plus is we are going to see Maori at, at looking into their own hapu and developing um, more information. And from time to time, um, in fact, even with Hei he Tohu and up uh, at Waitangi, people get in touch with us and there are two people who were working on this exhibition, the two curators, um, and we, it, by, by email we get this, what do you think of this? So-and-so is researching um, the, to, to Popoto in the north and wants to know, ca um, can, you, can you tell us any more about these people? So this is quite uh, um, a work in progress, identifying those who signed. Um, and I think it's going to continue. And it, it will probably continue as it should with um, people drawing on um, oral traditions and knowledge of, of what they think had happened um, with maybe a woman being caught up, one of the sisters being caught up or the wife of somebody who was going forward to sign. And because she herself might have been of um, status in Maori society, she was easily allowed to sign. And those who signed in um, several places uh, were certainly allowed to do so by missionaries who were very acutely aware that in uh, Victorian society, uh, even if um, Pākehā women didn't have certain powers, Māori women did. So, you know, this, this, these, these are important aspects that I think are gradually going to come out increasingly. Yes. And I'm just thinking about uh, your book that you had published earlier this year, uh, Te Tiriti o Waitangi, an illustrated history, the latest edition of, of that. Um, what are some of, the, some of the new aspects that you have um, been able to include in that, in that book? Well, there's several things, uh, really. I mean, it, the book itself has brought right up to date to 30th of September 2020. Um, the, the, the increasingly evolving nature of uh, the treaty uh, history um, and, its, uh, and its movement in contemporary society. Um, 
and then uh, increasingly too, because of Hei Tohu, the amount of work that's been done on the, those who signed the treaty. So the, the book incorporates that, incorporates the names, and um, it also incorporates each of the nine treaty copies and uh, a little quick history of, uh, of, of, the, of the context of that treaty uh, sheet. Um, so that in itself, I think, has unrolled quite a lot more. And uh, the, the book um, really deals, too, with settlements. And um, it can't keep up with them because many ha quite a number have come out even since uh, 2020. And that's going to continue too. But the book doesn't include uh, un, you know, the, the record of it up to that point in time when it went to mm -hmm. publication. I think the other area that um, is so different is we've, we have digitised so much of our collections. <clears throat> so you think of um, the images that we might have used um, as, I, as I did back in 2004 when an earlier edition of this came out. Um, quite a lot of them are in black and white. And the plus with this is you have a very rich collection of material that can be used. And because it was COVID and we were in lockdown for two months at least, um, I had to do the captions. So I was able to quietly build the captions into really a broader story than what was actually in the in the written text, mm -hmm. so you know that's a plus. I always say to people, oh, if it's too big a book, start with the images and mm -hmm. captions. Mm -hmm. There's a whole story there that you need to you to read. Absolutely, and just uh, thinking of of this latest book, and how have you experienced the reaction to this book as compared to how how your first book was received? Well, the first book in 1987, if you think of the context of the period when so much was happening so fast, I mean, not only had the, um, the, the, there were, the not only had the government uh, rolled back claims and the mandate of the tribunal to 1840, it also had included the treaty in pieces of legislation like the Environment and Conservation Act. Um, and the uh, Court of Appeal case, 1987, um, the Murray Fenua uh, claims hearings, uh, there was so much happening that it was uh, right in front of people's noses in their daily paper. And so that when the book came out in 1987, um, people f realized that it, it was supplying an answer um, to their queries and their puzzlement, I suppose, and also their sense of anger and fear. Uh, at least it gave them something they could get. And so it became book of the year and was on uh, you know, the best-selling list for about you know, six weeks or something. I think the difference now is we have a different context, uh, Cowan, really. I think uh, people have become more, more uh, understanding of the need for settlement. They want, there's a very large proportion of the public um, that doesn't hesitate in saying, look, we, we know things have not been good, we want to see the settlements go through. So that you're working in a different context, actually. Um, so the difficulty now, I think, is that people do have kind of a, um, a gloss that they have carried with them, really, from their very early years. Um, of you know, still lacking a degree of trust in the Maori area, and this is a real problem um, in terms of you know how uh, how does the country take it things through with the treaty relationship towards 2040, you know, and that's going to be the 200th centenary of the signing. Um, we've gone such a long way with the settlements and the degree of governance um, and the shifting. Uh, relationship between the Crown and Māori. So the real difficulty now is moving forward in such a way that even those who haven't had the benefit of school history um, ha are gradually going to 
come to a realization that it's, this is going to be of benefit. What, whatever they do or whatever they feel they can accept is going to be more better for the country as a whole. And, uh, you know, the other advantage, I think, is that, you know, we're better placed to talk about these things in a way that we never were perhaps before. Um, you know, by and large, I think the people were far too smug. And so the difference now is that with COVID, highlighting some of the socioeconomic disadvantages of, of a large proportion of the Maori population, not the whole, but a large proportion, um, and um, then increasingly too, the need to, to address the climate um, crisis that we've got. So, you know, we're looking at a, at a country which is well placed for discussions. And I think uh, with the constitutional review of 2013 and the report there, um, where they were talking about the range of aspects to do with constitutional um, government. Um, and then the 2016 report that came out of Matiki Mai and um, 250 hui that had been held, again, to discuss the constitutional review. Um, in each case, they said di discussions need to keep on going. So, Irene, what we're really looking at as a need to gradually move forward and how we do that um, remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, even though pe people were um, surprised and uh, perhaps uh, perturbed by um, the Hei Pua Pua uh, paper coming out um, that had been put on hold because I think, na, you know, Nanaya Mahuta and government had enough challenges with things going on in 2020 and COVID. But thinking through some of the, the that, uh, that um, paper actually was pointing out that there was much happening anyway. And the real question is, uh, how do we take it further? And how do we, uh, as a nation, start thinking through what we would like? To see. So um, just thinking about a couple of those kind of big issues, uh, you talked about climate change, thinking about the kind of socio-economic um, inequities that, that have really been exposed or exacerbated through COVID. And do you see Te Tiriti speaking to those issues, providing a framework for working through those questions? That's a pretty hard question to answer. <laughs> I think um, the, the, it has challenged people to, to realise much more sharply the real issues and also perhaps the, the disadvantage um, is that they can't see it being solved quickly. That this is, this is uh, we're looking at um, generations who have come through in a, uh, in a more or less disadvantaged situation. And the question now is how can we move ahead um, looking at the treaty as a framework um, but accepting um, the, what, you know, the, the underpinning re need uh, that the treaty promise suggests of coming together in, a, in partnership. Um, but, you know, again, people will question how great, what are the percentage, you know, no marriage is equal. <laughs> well, there's always a partnership there and it's always negotiated. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be true probably through every marriage at any time. So a marriage between the state and Māori, uh, the question is how, how can we do that? Mm. How can we resolve this? Once again, I think that discussion is absolutely essential. Mm. Um, and, you know, you need to have greater open-mindedness um, in, in a public service you all. So uh, in some cases, let's be frank, you need a, a change of mindset. And that's not going to be happen easily. Mm. It's often uh, something that can be prompted by a personal experience that they might have had mm. at a wananga or somewhere mm. of that sort. Yeah. I think the point you make about the understanding the partnership as, as being dynamic and kind of highly contextualised as well is important and, and yeah. also relates to, um, I, I think when you talked about understanding the different copies of Te Tiriti and the context in which they were signed at different places, 
bringing together that, that very localised, contextualised understanding is really important. And also, as you mentioned, thinking through these big issues by understanding the historical context of them as being ways of working through solutions to them as well. Um, I just want to finally maybe bring you to thinking about 2040, uh, the, that's <laughs> obviously the bicentenary of, of the signing of Te Tiriti, uh, but also is the date that uh, Mātike Mai and Te Puapua have identified as, as kind of milestone dates by where we would want to have progressed uh, the relationship or the partnership a bit further. Uh, what would you like to, where would you like to see us in, in 2040? Once again, I think that um, I'm only one person in a population of five million. So again, it comes back really to where do uh, people going to feel comfortable? I do think people need to be brave and, or, and, uh, and there needs to be a dynamism in decisions that are made. Um, and again, you're up against a democratic structure in New Zealand where whatever is the government that's in power is going to be careful to make decisions. That's a great shame. And no, I mean, you look back to the 1990s with um, Jim Bolger and Doug Graham, and they went out on a limb, surprisingly, really looking back and say, saying, look, Crown, here are Crown proposals and it's one billion over two years is all we, we, you know, we'll be paying out. Well, that has changed dramatically. So I guess what I'd be looking for is um, a, quite a dy dynamic coming from government itself um, that will um, perhaps with tact but with dedication um, start, starting to put spades in the ground in terms of moving forward. And there are um, th very interesting dates that we can use before 2040. I mean, it was the Governor-General at the time in, in 1932 that gave um, all of us in New Zealand Waitangi as a place that, we, we, that would bring us together as a nation. Um, so, you know, 1932 is going, or 2032 is going to be an interesting date. Um, and there will be other dates. Um, the promise made by the Labour government to do something about the treaty in 1925. You could have it in 2025. So, you know, the, the Heipupua didn't, was not extreme in what it was suggesting. It was actually tracking da over a number of areas that were already being developed and happening. It's really just a question that at the end how do we um, e give effect to a rebalancing of the state Maori relationship? So what I would like, is, obviously, is some statement from government finally towards or at 2040 that would acknowledge this rebalancing. But again, um, that won't be for me to say. So it really, we have to wait for a democratic decision on this. It might be a good point to draw our conversation to a close, but um, thank you very much for sharing that kōrero. Uh, so, tēnā koe e te kahurangi. Oh, kia ora, um, Kawan, and thank you for all the help that you've given me.